call of the eastern bluebird welcoming spring. This call is not always common on the landscape. Today we're going to talk to you about the natural history of this amazing bird and its recovery. Historically, the preferred habitat of the eastern bluebird was oak savanna. Big trees, low vegetation. As times and habitats have changed, now you can find them in parks and cemeteries. The loss of trees and wooden fence posts meant there were fewer cavities. With the introduction of the non-native house sparrow from Europe, competition for these cavities became more fierce. The introduction of the cat as a predator was one more stress on the bluebird. A lot of our native wildlife, including raccoons, possums, flying squirrels, and many birds are cavity nesters. Woodpeckers have long been our best cavity makers. Now we're making do with nest boxes. Size and the size of the hole matter, whether it's for bluebird, kestrel, or barn owl. The placement of your bluebird box is critical. Notice we're out here in the open, not in the forest, but we're near the edge of the forest, so there's good perches available to the bluebirds. We have a metal post here that we've mounted it on. We're having a wooden post with tin wrapped around it so that predators can't climb up and raid the nest. Then there's the actual bluebird box itself. Lots of different designs. There's been a lot of trial and error and research that went into these different designs. One of the things that's critical is this hole one and a half inches around. This allows the bluebirds to go in, but keeps the European starlings out. The uh, height is also really important. It can vary anywhere from 20 feet down to four feet. We like to have it mounted at eye level, so it guarantees that someone will come along and monitor the box. This is public enemy number one, the house sparrow. This is a non-native species that will compete with the bluebirds for those nest boxes. This is why we monitor the boxes. This is the only bird nest that it is legal to remove. There's more information about this in our handbook. Some guests that we do welcome, the tree swallow, our friend, the black cap chickadee, and the melodious house wren. It's time to start monitoring the boxes, and we're gonna show you how. The basic kit, notice I am wearing gloves in case there's unexpected critters, includes our monitoring book, a whisk broom, A pocket knife, which has my screwdrivers on it. A small claw hammer. A putty knife. A mirror. And a bar of soap. The first few times you're monitoring a box in the season and you're not sure if there's anything in it, make sure when you approach it, you knock on it to alert any possible inhabitants. That might include mice and wasps if you're not sure about the post. These will startle you. This one has nails. Remove and hold on to and open the box. This one has a wasp nest. We're early in the season, so there's no active wasps. So you scrape it off and then you rub some soap on the top to discourage future wasps from making a nest. I'm going to sweep it out. And close it back up. This is our first test of the season, so we didn't see much. We did add soap. A few other items I keep in my monitoring kit include a mirror to check on eggs and nestlings when I don't want to pull the nest out, a hammer in case the box is closed with a stubborn nail, the screwdriver on my knife in case the box is closed with a screw, and the box in case the nest is falling apart or I have a nestling that needs a temporary home 
Remember, most birds do not have a good sense of smell, so I can just take the nestling, pop it right back into the box before I close it up and leave. For more information on the bluebirds, look on the back side of our bluebird monitoring pamphlet for information. For some of you, this will be a passing fancy. For others, this is your next passion. I'd like to finish with a quote from the Cialis website. There may not be much the individual can do to help the bald eagle, California condor, or whooping crane, but the individual can help the bluebird.